start. I, I think we should start. Yeah, should. but this is a bit annoying. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we just see the slide. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start, can we? Yeah, yeah, shall we? Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I noticed a few names that I don't know. Um, I'm not sure if you guys uh I've, I'm not sure if we met before. Um perhaps uh you can just introduce yourself in the chat if just just for my own benefit, because uh if, if I haven't met you before, then it's good for me to know. Um just just let me know your your name as well as your school and your area of perhaps your, your area of research or your area of study. That would be great. Uh, rather than going around the room, right, which I think that not everybody is maybe uh, ready for that. So Dr. Kira, uh, IT department, OK. Nice to meet you. Um, Justina is typing. I know Kaldip. <laughs> I know Dr. Tan. Uh, Hi, morning, Kenneth. Morning, Kaldip. How are you? Good, good, very good. Yeah, I know Sit I know Haja. Uh yeah, but I think some of you, I'm not sure how often that you guys meet up. Uh, so also would be nice to for all of you to sort of get to know one another a little bit. Um, Sanjay, I think I haven't met. Sanjay, I haven't met. Justina, Justina, I'm a bit touch and go. I'm not sure if I've met you before. Or if I'm remembering a different Justina. <laughs> uh, Okay. Uh, Justina from IT Computing, also Penang Campus. Hazim, uh, I barely know. Uh, <laughs> even though we spent like uh, four years in the same office. Uh, and uh, yeah. Cool. All right. So um, today's today's session will basically be looking into uh, research ethics in practice. Uh, for those of you who don't know me. My name is Kenneth. I currently am based in the University of Malaya um, in the Department of Science and Technology Studies. Um, I was previously with the Postgraduate Research Center uh, at UOW. And uh, so I'm very happy that my uh, ex colleagues have decided to uh, look me in for various different trainings and various different. Uh, opportunities for me to come back and uh, contribute to UW. Uh, I'm actually, I'm also one of, I'm actually an adjunct lecturer as well, an adjunct lecturer at UW. So basically, um, I have still some ties uh, with UW. Uh, I still, uh, I still actually supervise a few postgraduate by research students. And I am still involved in uh, training as well as various different things happening in the campus. OK, but my day job is basically at uh, UM. Um, my role here is as a senior lecturer. Um, I am in case you're wondering. Uh, I am currently on what they call a tenure track position, so basically uh, a number of years on contract basis. And if I want to get confirmed or become permanent staff, I need to meet the criteria for promotion to associate professor. So that's the way they do things at public university these days. And uh, becoming associate professor in UM is, is quite a tall order uh, compared to other universities. Um, so we'll see what happens. I have another four and a half years left to prove myself. <laughs> But yeah, let's see how that goes. Um, so in case anybody has any questions for me, uh, do leave the questions in the chat. I will be checking it periodically. Uh, I, 
intend to finish most of my content uh, in about two hours. Uh, this, this particular training is actually scheduled for four. But what I will do is that for the remaining two hours will be partly self-reflection as well as um, your, your, your participation in some, uh, uh, in some, I won't call it homework, but I would say that it is more of an exercise for you to actually try some of the research uh, ethics uh, forms that have been prepared by uh, UOW, okay? So, so basically, uh, let's get through the, the, the content first and let's see where we are. Uh, but very likely, as, as most of my trainings go, uh, we may not end too late. Um, Hazim, are we already recording? I'm not sure if you want to record. Oh, it is recording. Okay. Yeah. All right. So leave Hazim a step away. Okay. So the, the, the topic of today's uh, uh, training is basically research ethics in practice. My intention is to basically do like uh, introduction to begin with. We'll probably stop at about 10 o'clock. Um, before and take a quick break before we proceed on with the rest um, of the content. And then after that, uh, we'll see where we are. Um, if I can finish before lunch, that would be great. Okay, so um, so today, my part of my role here in UM, right, is to basically uh, teach a general course for all science graduates, for all science students. Uh, I'm part of the Faculty of Science. It's all about ethics in research, okay? Um, on top of my general duties, teaching research methodology, as well as other specialist subjects uh, related to policy and management of sustainable development um, in, in University of Malaya. Um, this is one of the topics that gets a lot of attention, uh, particularly among our undergraduates. Uh, we teach this particular uh, course on science, technology, and society for all undergraduate science students in University of Malaya. Um, and part of it is to cover the concept of ethics. Okay. Now, ethics in research has um, a bit of a history, okay, because ethics is something that, you know, um, people don't think about unless something really bad happens. Okay, let's just put it that way. Okay, it never becomes an issue until it becomes a really big issue. Okay, um, so for example, right, when we think back on, and I'm going to start at like a very large big picture account first, and then we go down to the nitty gritty of um, what is expected of you as researchers, what is expected of your students as researchers uh, later on. But right now, let's just let's just start with a big picture because that's what we do on a Friday morning. Um, so back in the Renaissance period or back in the 1800s, right, during the Industrial Revolution, uh, research was seen as a, as a process that a lot of aristocrats or a lot of people with uh, power or with time on their hands, that's something that they do in order to investigate the natural environment that is around them, okay? So when you think about um, back in those days in Europe, when they do science, right, normally it's being done by monks in monasteries. It's normally done by uh, lords and dukes in their home laboratories, messing around with chemicals and things like that. And this is a process that, you know, is very intellectually driven. But at the same time, it's also something that um, it's something that people with, with very different concepts of right and wrong, right, may actually manipulate to their own, uh, to their own, uh, to their own sort of, uh, motivations. Okay. So when you think about things like, when you read about stories such as like, you know, Dr. Frankenstein, or you read about other stories that relate to mad scientists, they come from a particular basis, okay? Because in the past, 
a lot of aristocrats, they actually mess around with these things. And they felt that it was justified because they felt that they were superior to others. Okay. Um, in particular, there was one particular case. I didn't put this in the slides, but there was one particular case where there was a scientist back then who actually had the notion that the larger your brains are, the more civilized you would be. And this was part of the reasons why he had these very racist kind of beliefs, because he felt that people of a certain gender, people of a certain color, uh, skin color, were generally less intelligent and therefore inferior to others. Okay, so a lot of these, a lot of these belief systems, right, sort of permeated in, in, uh, in, I won't say medieval Europe, but in, uh, in, in that particular point in time. And a lot of the times, right, when they talk about these things, right, they felt that they have what they call scientific evidence because they went about doing all of these nasty experiments, you know, um, sometimes, you know, people will just go missing and uh, particularly those of the lower class that were not particularly missed. And these basically contributed to a lot of the research that was being done at that point in time, which were very painful, which had very little regard for human rights and which ultimately was very, uh, you know, nowadays we would call it very inhumane. Okay. All of these things came to a head in the Second World War, all right? So during the Second World War, what happened was that German scientists, particularly those that were affiliated with the Nazi regime, would actually do research on um, members of the concentration camps, okay? So um, back then, I don't need to rehash all of this, but back then, Nazi Germany, uh, ran a lot of concentration camps because there were actually uh, there was actually a genocide of of Jewish people. Um, so what the scientists actually did then was that they would take uh, these uh, members of the concentration camps and they would do experiments on them, trying to make them look more like them. Okay, whether it was uh, trying to change the eye color to blue, trying to change the hair color to blonde, and things like that. So what happened was that after the war, all of these scientists, well, most of them that they managed to actually capture were tried for crimes against humanity, okay? And it was around that time when the nations basically realized that research, if gone unchecked, or if not, I would say, if, if it's not regulated well, Ultimately, it can lead to various, very disastrous consequences. So this is why um, the, the various intergovernmental bodies basically wrote a code of conduct for research. And they basically produced uh, guidelines, books, as well as different types of uh, um, literature to clarify what is appropriate for research and what is not appropriate for research. Okay, so since then, the second half of the 20th century to present day, research has become more institutionalized, it's become a lot more formalized, well as a discipline, okay? a lot of uh, regula regulations in order for you to actually conduct your research. And a lot of these are actually put in place to safeguard not just the researchers, but also to safeguard those who are participating in experimental research or, exp or, or research in general, okay? So um, that is part of the concept behind ethics and research. Now, you may ask the question, a lot of you here are actually researchers in IT. Some of you here are researchers in the field of business studies, okay? Now, how does this necessarily relate to you, okay? You can imagine that, okay, if it's research in terms with regards to medicine, biology, or research regards to engineering, or, or, you know, like anything that involves 
the potential loss of human life or the potential potential loss of or the potential disability of the human life, right? Then maybe it makes sense. But when it comes to the principles of research, right, there are certain parts of it that relates to not just the social sciences and the humanities, but also the applied sciences that deal with artificial uh, intelligence or you know other forms of uh, other forms of research that may not necessarily involve human life okay now ethics at the end of the day right relates to uh not just your research as uh, the way you treat your uh, research subjects but also regards to the way you conduct yourself as a researcher okay it involves you being able to uh display integrity and also uh, be able to, you know, conduct credible research that's both valid and reliable. All right. Now, all research is basically uh, governed by these four principles. The first is that you respect the person and you actually uh, treat them as you want them to, as you want them to treat you. Okay. Um, in this case, right. Everyone here, everyone that participates or everyone that you request to participate would have their own inherent worth or value. So it's important for you to basically treat them with respect. Okay. Um, in the case of dealing with uh, research subjects, okay, the first part is confidentiality, where you do not are uh, where you're not supposed to disclose their identity, where you're not supposed to disclose their, um, their, their personal details. Um, you know, and even though they may actually ask you to, okay, I, re I, re I recall that some of our interview subjects, they're actually quite happy uh, because they want the free marketing, right? They're actually quite happy for their uh, profile to be made known. Um, but then what you have to make clear, okay, just so that they are right expectation, right, is that a lot of times your research project would not be done with the purpose of marketing, okay? So, for example, right, if let's say I were to go and do uh, a research, uh, go out and do field work um, and do a bunch of interviews uh, with, with certain uh, entrepreneurs, okay? For example, I had... A project a few years ago where we were talking about the startup ecosystem in uh, Malaysia or in KL specifically, and we were doing a we were doing a, a series of interviews with different startup CEOs and asking them about you know what what do they what do they see or what do they how do they feel about the startup ecosystem in uh, in, in KL. Um, during this process, a lot of them are actually like saying, "Hey, um, we're actually quite happy if you want to use our names or use our." our uh use our company names and things like that but then what i told them was that this is actually not meant for public consumption it is actually meant for um policy and a lot of times when it comes to policy um the standard is to keep everyone anonymous uh because we want to ensure that uh there is no there is no there's no uh you know there is no any kind of uh there's no uh, blowback, uh, basically, for any of the things that you say. And also because then we keep everything standard because just because you want to have your name put out there doesn't mean that other people are interested to have their names put out there as well. So um, what I do tell them otherwise is that if let's say they are keen for me for, 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 for a little bit of uh, free publicity, um, I could actually prepare a separate press release or prepare a separate story that I can actually put out there um to to sort of talk about the the findings of the story as a media article okay that's fine okay as long as it does not actually display any of the actual data that you're actually going to publish okay so so that will be with regards to confidentiality um also people are actually given the opportunity to decline participating in your research project so it means that when you approach your participants they have the freedom to actually decide whether or not they want to actually participate or not. Okay, so there should not be any sort of pressure for consent. Okay, and any form of consent, right, has to be informed. 
So meaning to say that you need to tell your research participants the purpose of your study, um, the aims as well as the objectives, and how they are studied and how their data is actually going to be kept and utilized for uh, for future use. Okay. Um, so normally what this means is that you would actually have either an informed consent form or some kind of a disclaimer at the beginning of your survey form in order to capture this kind of information. Okay. Also, you need to be accountable. So um, one, one aspect of this is like, if let's say I were to do an interview, right? I would actually um, transcribe the outcomes of the interview first after the interview is done, okay? Uh, if let's say I use a machine learning algorithm or whatever, or, or some kind of closed captioning to actually help me to actually uh, produce the transcript from the recording, I would normally send the transcript to the um, to the interviewee after the interview, just for them to actually have a look through to check and see whether or not uh, the transcription was done accurately. Okay. And during this process, if let's say the interviewee has anything they would like to amend, they have the right to do so. As well as if let's say the interviewee chooses not to participate anymore, they also have the right to do so. Okay, so the person actually has choice when it comes to how they want their expressions to be uh, to be uh, presented and also whether or not their data can actually be utilized during the study or not, okay? The second principle is beneficence, which is to do good, all right? It means to say that whenever you do any kind of research, your intentions is actually for towards kindness, towards charity, towards the welfare of others, okay? Uh, this is sort of intertwined with non-maleficence, like do no harm. Uh, and, and the intention of this, right, is that you ultimately align your research towards benefiting those that participate or benefiting those that uh, will, you know, that will ultimately uh, be affected by the outcomes of your research project, okay? Uh, beneficence is very different from... Uh, it's not quite the same as providing tokens. Yeah, um, we, we're not talking about benefits in terms of you know buying them souvenirs or buying them like Starbucks vouchers and things like that. Uh, okay, uh, that's not what I meant. All right. Um, yes, it is possible for you to uh, provide some kind of token of appreciation. Okay. Uh, for your research subjects, if let's say it's a survey, you know sometimes you know you provide them with like twenty bucks of of some kind of token. Uh, if let's say it's an uh, interview, you might provide them with something, you know, things like that. Um, that is a different subject, okay? Uh, for research ethics, you know, beneficence is talking about uh, how do you uh, ensure that your intentions and also your motivations for doing the research ultimately uh, is, 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 uh, is inclined towards doing good as opposed to doing for lack of a better word, for doing evil, okay? So, so that is the intention of doing this kind of study, all right? Okay, the third one is non-maleficence, which says do no harm, okay? This means that when we do any kind of research, we're not intending to inflict any kind of pain, any kind of suffering, any kind of distress, okay? So any kind of research that involves participation, okay? has to be tempered with sufficient um, sufficient uh, controls, fail-safes, and different kind of uh, procedures in order to reduce the risk of harm to the participants, okay? So in other words, your obligation to your research subjects is to A, prevent harm, B, promote good, okay? Um, it's not to say that you cannot do the research, um, but if let's say if it involves any kind of potential suffering or potential distress, right? Um, you know, the the research ethics board will actually have the will actually be less inclined to actually approve your research. Okay. 
So it means that invasive procedures, right? Okay, any kind of process or any kind of uh, research that involves uh, cutting people, <laughs> okay, like biopsies, right, are less acceptable, right, compared to those that obtain other samples um, that are uh, more more easier to collect, lah. Okay, so yeah, so that is the concept behind do no harm. Now. We say here physical or psychological, which means to say that especially when it comes to uh, new products or new uh, or, or, you know, like marketing new ideas and things like that. Um, if let's say you actually cause any kind of emotional distress, any kind of psychological uh, distress, it can actually fall and it actually it can actually like, you know, go against this particular principle. OK. You know, like for example, once upon a time there was a lot of uh, people who used like strobe lighting. Okay, um, and and these kind of these kind of uh, these kind of effects, right? Visual effects can actually have psychological distress for people who are very photosensitive. Okay, meaning to say that people who don't like to see too many flashy lights, um, they can actually get nauseous. They can actually start throwing up. Or you know things like that, lah. All right. So, so that is the issue with with some of these kind of processes, lah. Um. So whenever you produce a research project, you need to be very careful to make sure that you know how to actually handle a situation, um, that may actually cause harm to your participants. Okay. Um. So yeah. So that is the third principle. The fourth principle is this: justice and fairness. OK, where you promote equality of treatment, fair sharing of benefits and burdens and fair selection of individuals in that particular class. So you have to actually show that the way you actually uh, select your research participants is done, uh, you know, uh, very fairly and you're not doing it because of any kind of. Uh, you're not doing it with any sort of um, selection bias. OK, um, so in that sense, right, whenever you do any kind of um, uh, research, it has to actually be able to convince the research ethics board that you are actually uh, being very fair and that you are not just selecting uh, participants just because they may be either more available or just because, you know, like uh, you have access to this particular group of people. OK, all right. So before we continue, maybe we can just have a quick discussion um, in the chat room. Um, can you maybe just tell me what is probably the the, the most difficult uh, principle to adhere to in your research process or, or in your research um, out of these four? Okay. Just in the chat. Anybody? Just checking to see if anybody is actually there. Out of the four. So um, the four would be, let me just backtrack, yeah? Uh, autonomy, respect for the person. Beneficence, um, non-maleficence, do no harm, and also justice. All right, maybe I'll just continue first. If you guys have anything you guys want to add, you guys can just drop it off in the chat. Yeah. Everyone can hear me, right? Everyone can hear me, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Can. Okay. So far, am I making sense? Hard to think about the answer. Okay, no problem. No problem. All right. 
So when we talk about ethical concern, okay, we talk about three different things. One is the way you treat your research participants. Uh, the second one is to talk about how you relate society with science. Okay, there's ethical issues there. And the third one is about um, your own professional conduct as a scientist. Okay, um, so we're going to go through these three things uh, today. Um, so let's get the, the more philosophical ones out of the way first. Okay. Okay. Um, so this one is talking about how society relates with science. And this is sort of like my area of research. Okay. Um, so this one is a little bit more, you know, it could be a bit more of a management decision. Okay. Um, so there is a notion that researchers should actually do research on what they are passionate about. Okay. There's that kind of notion. All right. So there's one school of thought that says that research should be done based on a researcher's uh, area of interest, area of passion and things like that. Okay, there's another school of thought that says that researchers should conduct research in what is considered to be more important to society at a given time. Okay, um, obviously the, the first school of thought does not have a lot of does not have a lot of supporters, uh, okay? The people who support the first school of thought are typically the researchers themselves, okay? Because they want to do things that they're actually keen to do, okay? Um, some researchers, they are very passionate about a particular area, but um, those particular areas could take a very long gestation time, or it could maybe not lead to the outcomes that you think is going to be beneficial, okay? The second school of thought has a lot more uh, has a lot more supporters. Okay, government believes that you know researchers should do research that is important to society and not just something that you know makes them the the Malay term is uh, shops and lah. Okay, a lot of times that's what they feel that researchers are doing. They are actually doing research that you know ultimately is just to give them self gratification. Um, now, is, it, is, it, there is a point there, okay? Um, but at the same time, should researchers really be seen as the people who are going to save the world, okay? Um, and, okay, that's normally part of our problem, uh, you know? Researchers tend to, especially certain groups of researchers, they tend to portray themselves as being uh, very impactful, you know, have the opportunity to, you know, save lives or, you know, reverse climate change, blah, blah, and things like that. But at the same time, not all researchers set out with those intentions, okay? Uh, some researchers actually do set out with the intentions to just, you know, develop new knowledge. And, um, but at the same time, our, our current climate, right, or our current environment for doing research has a lot to do with uh, creating impact in society, you know? Um, and that is part of the reason why the way our funding agencies are set up, um, usually they dictate the areas of research that they feel would be important for society. And they would only fund research in the areas that they feel will create impact in society. Uh, in the same way, right, whenever we do any kind of research grant proposals, we are expected to align with certain policies, blueprints, uh, roadmaps, and things like that, because these are the areas that policymakers feel would ultimately contribute to societal progress. Okay? Um, okay, it's not wrong. All right, I'm not saying it's wrong, but at the same time, it kind of restricts your thinking and it kind of actually focuses your attention on issues that are particularly more pertinent or more urgent um, for, for, for the way things are being done right currently. Okay. Um, there was a report that was released a few years ago uh, by the International Science Council called Unleashing Science. Okay. In that particular report, the group of policymakers and various different experts uh, basically 
what they, they came to the conclusion or they came to the statement that the way science is being done now, it's very slow. OK, the way that research is being done now is very slow. It is very deliberate, uh, very sluggish, and ultimately does not lead to any real impact in society. OK, it's being done with the intention to reconfirm uh, concepts that have very little implication to how business is actually being done on the ground. OK, uh, and they also felt that the way that uh, we do research ultimately does not lead to any real solutions. OK, it's the report is called Unleashing Science. You can probably find it online. It's actually free. Um, but the, the, the reason behind this, right, is that they, they felt that the all the various different goals that uh, that we have sort of ratified or that we're sort of aligned to, you know, like uh, net zero carbon emissions, uh, sustainable development goals, uh, all of these various things, right, ultimately can't be achieved if we continue to do science the way we are doing it now. Okay, because the way we're doing science right now, right, ultimately it does not lead us anywhere. Uh, but at the same time, as researchers, we also want to ask the question, right, like, um, ultimately, is it really our responsibility to address societal concern? Okay, in a way, that is the role of government. Um, that is the role of, in a way, government research institutes. Okay. Um, and also, you know, international conglomerates, firms, there are a lot more stakeholders in these conversations as opposed to just relying on academia. OK, we feel some some academics will actually argue that academia, we're here mainly to conduct fundamental research. We're here mainly to pass knowledge on to the next generation. And that's our role, OK? Uh, expecting us to uh, do everything, <laughs> for lack of a better word, to do everything is actually quite, um, first of all, illogical and not very, uh, not very practical, okay? Because you can't just overload academics and expect them to produce miracles, all right? Um, but at the same time, expertise is still expertise, okay? Um, a lot of government people would argue that you guys are the experts. You guys know what you guys are doing. You have the networks as well as the resources um, and the know-how to actually do all of these things. So that is why they expect um, academia to sort of take the lead. Okay, But this is not just about researchers alone. Okay? Ultimately, the... The, the areas of concern would require a multi-stakeholder approach that ties academia, industry, and government together in a in a in a interacting in a way that you know ultimately will lead to sustainable solutions in the world that we live in. All right. So this is sort of like if you guys are interested in this, you know, let me know. Um, we do this kind of convers conversations in our particular department. Yeah. Um, okay, the second thing that we want to talk about here is regarding to professional conduct. Okay, um, for your for your information, uh, a lot of this content is actually from Prof. Hon. <laughs> okay, um, so the first thing is 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 the way you actually uh, produce your research uh, output. Okay, um, fabricating or altering your results is considered a big no. Okay. Um, you do not falsify your research, okay? You do not, um, um, you do not alter your research uh, results in any way. I mean, that's a that's a major that's a major cause for research misconduct. And and how do people find out? Okay, now a lot of times, right? What happens is that if let's say you have been, you are producing a type of research that, you know, is very unique or very interesting, or you, or you claim that you're doing something very, very important, right? A lot of research labs around the world will basically read your paper and say, okay, 
um, you guys are claiming such a big thing. Let's try to replicate your research, okay? That is why in, when you submit for peer review, one thing that I actually require you to do is produce a very detailed methodology section for people to try and replicate. If let's say people want to replicate your research, they would be able to do it and they should be able to get the same results as you did, okay? If let's say people replicate your research and you realize that they cannot replicate your results, there is evidence to suggest that you have fabricated your results. All right. And there are watchdogs out there. Okay. For example, if you look at Retraction Watch, okay. Retraction Watch is basically a website dedicated to catching research misconduct. Um, and if let's say they realize that your research is not done credibly, you may be required or you may be requested or they may just do it to, they will retract your paper, okay? They will take it off and then you will essentially be blacklisted. So that can happen, okay? Um, in the same way, right? Um, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Though. Okay, but then in the same way, uh, whenever you're publishing any kind of research, you cannot publish the same data or results in more than one journal or one publication. Okay, uh, when whenever you submit a paper to a journal, right? In theory, that particular journal is holding the copyright to your research. Okay, so sending it to a different journal at the same time is considered a, a breach. Okay, of that first initial. Uh, submission. Okay, so no matter how long it takes for them to actually conduct the peer review for the first paper, right? You cannot resubmit that same paper to a different journal while the paper is being reviewed by another journal. All right, you cannot do that. Okay, that is that is that is uh, that is duplicity. Okay. Um, the other thing is partial publication. Now, public partial publication, right? It can be a little bit of a gray area. Okay. Uh, what it means in public partial publication is that if you do a big project and you're able to come up with like multiple different papers from that one big project, okay, um, you have to actually create different publications with different research questions and different data sets, okay, and you can publish it separately. However, people will argue that if you can actually publish all of this as one paper, you should do that instead, okay. Um, that's a fair point, okay? But it depends on how you want to facilitate the scientific communication. If you feel that by publishing all the papers as one big paper, right, you'll ultimately be too long or too difficult to read, okay? You will realize that it actually makes more sense for you to break it up into multiple different papers, okay? So as long as it facilitates clear scientific communication, okay, otherwise it should be avoided, right? Um, the other thing is the position of the authorship. Now, the reason why the position of an author is important in a paper, right, whether you go first author, second author, or last author, right, it's dependent on the way your organization rewards uh, publication. So like in University of Malaya, okay, um, if you are first author or corresponding author, your pointers are quite high. But anything less than second author, right? You realize that your KPI points are actually quite low. Okay, because they don't want to. They don't want to. Uh, they don't want to reward piggybacking. Okay, so if you are piggybacking on other people's research, uh, that is not their interest, lah. Okay, so that is that is authorship considerations. Now another thing to consider is this here. A lot of there are a lot of journals out there now that are promising a very fast turnaround, okay, very fast peer review process, um, and also very fast uh, uh, lead time to publication. Uh, but they charge very high article processing charges or APC. Um, you have to be very careful about this. Okay, even though let's say that it may be from a reputable journal, okay, 
um, you know, they could be very, very highly ranked. But some publishers practice very dubious, uh, very dubious kind of uh, processes. So you have to be very careful with this because it will affect your reputation as a researcher. Okay. Um, just last week, what happened was that the Ministry of Higher Education released a circular saying that um, government funding, okay, government funding, whether it is FRGS or PRGS or whatever, right, cannot be used to pay for publications in either MDPI, Hindawi, or Frontier Journals. Okay, so any of these three publishers, you cannot use government money to actually pay for it. All right. Um, it's not to say that these journals are bad, okay? But uh, it's sort of the continuation of a trend nowadays to uh, blanket ban <laughs> or cancel certain journals that or certain publishers that have been accused of predatory of, of, of being predatory journals or predatory publishers. Okay, there are certain universities that straight up ban MDPI. Okay. Um, Hindawi, no, no need to say. Uh, so, so there are these kind of situations that are happening in, in academic publication. Uh, all right. Um, so in UM, normally the 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 saying goes right that if you are publishing these journals, please be aware of the potential risk that this may have on your future career uh, sort of uh, progress. OK, because having published in a predatory journal, people may ultimately, um, you know, question the credibility of your research. Do you actually publish based on your own merit or do you publish because you were willing to pay for it? All right, those are the questions that people ask. Um, so yeah, so that's the situation that we find ourselves in. Okay, um, so yeah, academic work is not that fun after all. Okay, um, moving on. Um, there is also this concept of informed consent. So anytime that you ever do any kind of research that talks to other people, you actually need to get them to agree to a statement that describes the study and um, your formal request for their participation. Okay. So who should provide consent in your research? Now, uh, uh, two things you need to consent, yeah? These are the things you need to consider. One is their age, okay? Whether they are of legal age or not. The second one is whether they're able to make decisions, okay? So if let's say a particular uh, participant, you're doing, trying to do a research on school students or you're trying to do ed research regarding education, right? And your students are, have yet to reach the age of consent, okay? Then informed consent must not just be obtained from the uh, uh, participants, but also from parents or guardians of the minors, okay? Assent, on the other hand, also must be attend, obtained from the minors who are old enough or have enough intellectual capacity to say they are willing to participate. Okay, it means that they agree to be a participate after being informed of all the features of the study that could affect the participants' willingness to participate. Ability to make decisions mainly concern uh, participants who may have some kind of uh, learning disability. So they may be of age, but they are not able to make a decision. Okay, so in that sense, right? Um, Any time that you're dealing with participants who are not yet of age, or who may not be able to make decisions, right? You need to get informed consent, not just from the participants itself, but also from the uh, uh, parents or legal guardians. Okay. It is now 9.55. Perhaps we should take a break before we continue. Does that sound like a good idea? Let's just take 10 minutes and uh, return at 10.05. Okay.
Okay, 10 or 5. Let's get back into it. All right. Um, so I hope that everybody had a good 10 minutes to refresh themselves. Um, let's get back into the content. Um, I'm about halfway through my slides, and then after that, uh, I will basically be going through um, the research ethics policy uh, with all of you. Um, and uh, we will talk through some of the forms. I've actually, some, I've actually sent everything to all of you by email already. Okay, so I hope all of you got it. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, just to continue on. Okay, um, so we were talking earlier about the principles of research ethics. We talked a little bit about what is expected of us as researchers and also uh, the concept of inform informed consent. Okay, uh, in the previous slide, we talked about who and what are some, right now we're gonna talk a little bit about what are some of the key principles of informed consent. Okay, so uh, with if you inform consent, right, um, the few things that you need to assure your participants of is first of all, that there will not be any identifying information that will be collected. Okay, so you maintain that anonymity. The second one is that you'll maintain the confidentiality. Okay, so anything that can identify your participants will be kept confidential. All right. Um, another thing is that participation needs to be active or voluntary. Okay, so meaning to say that uh, it could be passive or active. So either you tell them that you have to actually sign the consent form in order to participate, or if let's say they don't return the consent form, then consider they are consenting to that particular. Uh, um, if they don't return the consent form, it means that they consent to their data being used. Okay, so um, passive is generally not well received, but can be accepted depending on the situation. Okay, um, but active uh, consent is normally the, the case that uh, we, we will prefer to have. Informed consent, right? That particular form should actually give the participant an uh, a, a, a description of what the research is about, who you are, what you are doing, okay? Um, what is the procedure like? Or what are the tools like? How long will the participants be involved in that particular process? Uh, what are the consequences to participating? What are the potential risks? What is, uh, there is, should be an offer or opportunity for the participants to withdraw if, let's say, that for any time, for any reason that they would like to actually do so. Um, it should outline the potential physical or psychological risks or discomforts. And it should uh, expand on the potential benefits to the participant in the society and how the researcher can be contacted and also that, you know, how will the results be kept confidential? Okay, so these are the various different aspects of an informed consent uh, form. Now, informed consent forms can be they're quite readily available online. Okay, um, you can generally find informed consent forms a lot, a lot of different places for templates. Um, you don't actually have to have. There is no real institutional template, as far as I know. Um, generally speaking, as long as you cover all of these aspects in your informed consent form, that should be sufficient. Okay. Um, do pay attention to the wording of what you're actually writing and please be very clear that you would actually be able to deliver on the various aspects of the informed consent form, okay, before you decide to use it, all right? Now, there are some cases in research that requires you to deceive your participants. Um, a lot of times this is because you would actually like to see how they react on that. I mean, the whole purpose of the research project is to see how they react to a particular incident, uh, which requires an element of surprise. OK, so deception is allowable when the benefits are way the cost. So, for example, if you would like to see how, you know, like shock marketing actually plays a better role in marketing the product product. If you want to get the informed consent, they will sort of see it coming. So then that kind of defeats the whole purpose of the actual research process, which is why deception has to be used. Now, if you're going to use deception, then it's important for you to have what they call a debriefing. Okay. So in a debriefing, 
some of the re information regarding the research process, especially the procedure or the purpose, is not actually revealed to the participants. Um, so the participants have actually been deceived to some extent. Now, straight after the study, you would actually need to go up to the participant and say, uh, sorry for any distress cause or hi, you know, my name is so and so. Uh, we're actually from the University of blah, blah, blah. Uh, we are actually conducting a study to see uh, what, you know, all of these sort of things. Uh, we're really sorry if let's say, you know, you were upset by it or but then. Uh, we would actually like to ask for your permission to actually use this recording or use this data for our study. You know, uh, you'll be kept anonymous. We will blot out your, your face and things like that. Lah. Okay, so the debriefing, the debriefing portion is where you're sort of getting informed consent after the fact. Okay, um, so this process usually can be a little bit uncomfortable depending on what you have actually used to deceive your participant, okay? Um, so when you do this process, right, you have to be very tactful, you have to be very, very sensitive, and hope the person has a sense of humor, okay? Um, so for example, you know, I think uh, the one process I actually do show my students was, uh, I think it was somewhere in Canada or the US, where they actually, um, where they actually conducted this social experiment where people uh, would, um, they will ask them to take care of their bag for them while they go off and do something. And then uh, somebody will just walk up and just pick up the bag and walk off. Okay. And they are, the, the whole research is to see how people will react, first of all, you know, and whether or not, you know, like whether or not they will actually remember who took the bag. Okay. <laughs> it was actually quite funny. Okay. So, so that is the, that is the whole process. Yeah. Now, um, the other thing is, how do you actually uh, promote credibility in your research? Okay, so these are some strategies for promoting uh, validity and reliability in uh, qualitative research. Okay, um, I've already shared you the slides. I won't go through all of them, but uh, these are some of the things that you would actually write about to actually detail out how you actually promote it. Um, and then when it comes to promoting responsible conduct, um, you actually have to show that the way you do your investigation is done with integrity. And it shows that you have awareness and application of established professional norms and ethical principles in all the activities you do related to your research. Now, um, like I said earlier, research misconduct is something that you need to avoid. Um, and it's something that you know can be very tempting but it's not very, uh, it's, it, it can be very disastrous if you get caught um, doing research misconduct, okay? Where you're fabricating data, you're falsifying data, or you're plagiarizing. Um, nowadays, with AI tools, with various different uh, ways of doctoring data, right? It becomes harder and harder for people to catch. But at this, in the same way that there are more and more tools to help you to cheat. There are also more and more tools being developed to help others to catch people cheating. Okay. Like for example, nowadays we have ChatGPT. Um, at the same time, Turnitin or other uh, companies also release tools to detect AI use in writing. Okay. So um, in that sense, right, uh, you know, don't always, you know, never, never, never get the feeling or never get complacent and feel like you can get away with it. Okay, let me just put that out there. Never feel as if like you can get away with it because most likely you can't. Okay. Um, so always be true. Always make sure that you are the one proposing, performing and reviewing your research in a way that it is, um, in a way that is responsible. Otherwise, you will struggle to um, be taken seriously as a researcher. Um, if you, if you do decide to, uh, violate these norms, right, um, it could mean very, very, you know, serious, um, uh, consequences. Okay. Uh, a lot of times our research, uh, ultimately defines who we are. Okay. When people look at our CV, uh, when people are evaluating us for future jobs, um, they will look at not just 
how many you publish, but also look at where you publish, what you publish, how you publish, okay? And these are the sort of criteria that people look into when they're deciding whether or not they want to hire you or whether or not they are keen to work with you, okay? Um, so, yeah. So uh, when it comes to responsible conduct research, you know, you need to, to show that you are very responsible when it comes to all of these various aspects of data management. Okay, whether it's the way you uh, the way you collect it, how you store it, how you protect it, how you retain it, or what you use for analysis and things like that. Okay. So um, when you are men when you are managing data, okay, uh, you have to ensure that not just to keep it in a place where it is considered confidential, but also in a way that it's, a, it's actually backed up so that you don't actually uh, lose it, you know, without, without uh, yeah. And then uh, you make sure that you only share the data with people that, you know, are, are part of your collaboration or, or part of your research group, and it should not be shared to the general public at any point in time. Okay, um, so what ultimately determines ethical decision making in research? Okay, so uh, like I said earlier, there are the regulations, the professional guidelines, and uh, norms. Um, there are also the ethical frameworks. Uh, so the ethical regulations, like UOW, basically had their research ethics policy being passed in 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the ethical frameworks are normally the ones that are intergovernmental. Okay. And they provide ethical frameworks, particularly for uh, research areas, okay, or, or broad research disciplines, okay. Um, there's also the legal regulation, okay, uh, that is part of uh, Malaysia's uh, public policy, and then lastly, there are also the individual moral framework. So basically, how you perceive what is ethical and what is not ethical in your decision making. Now. Um, where are the potential risk areas when it comes to uh, uh, research ethics? For qualitative studies, typically it is in the collection and the dissemination of your findings um, in the way that you uh, request for consent, the way that you protect privacy and confidentiality, um, and in your data analysis and reporting findings, whether to include or exclude sponsored research or any form of conflict of interest. Okay. Um, typically, if your research is being sponsored, uh, sometimes your sponsor will request that you research findings, okay? In that sense, right, you will have to be very tactful about how you want to proceed with this, okay? If, let's say, they're okay with you actually acknowledging them, okay, then you can actually put them in, okay? But you need to be very clear about what is the potential ramifications of that. Okay. So ultimately, right, research ethics ultimately depends on you, okay? Um, if you carry out your research ethically, if you're able to deal with the ethical dilemmas carefully, Okay, then in general, you should not have any issues when it comes to research ethics. Nonetheless, right, no one really knows this dilemma better than you do. Lah, okay, um, so how you actually are able to describe the risks, how you're able to detail out what are the potential issues and the potential ethical issues, um, ultimately largely depends on your attention to detail and your ability to determine contingencies or other issues that may actually arise. Okay. Um, I'm going to end my sharing or the first portion of my uh, of my uh, training right with a couple of case studies. Okay. And these are sort of like the classical case studies that um, you know we teach when it comes to research ethics. Um, so there is one particular case which is uh, very tragic. Um, so this was a case of this guy called Trofim Denisovich Lysenko. He is a Soviet biologist, agronomist, and geneticist during the Stalin regime. So Joseph Stalin basically was ruling um, Soviet, the Soviet Union. Okay, that's a very long name. That's a very old name. 
Okay, but in generally speaking, he was ruling the, the Rush ruling in Russia, okay. Um in between the 20s to the 50-ish, okay. Um Joseph Stalin was the person who basically came up after Lenin. Okay. And during his time was also the time of World War II. Lysenko was basically in charge of the Institute of Genetics of the Soviet Academy of Sciences in 33 onwards, okay, or in, in yeah, in the late 20s. Um, so this particular affair, right, basically is a classic example of how politics can actually corrupt science, undermine its rational, rational basis. So Lysenko basically, right, uh, he was a proponent of the concept of neo-Lamarckism, okay? And he rejected Mendelian genetics. So Mendelian genetics is what we subscribe to these days, um, whereby we believe that um, based on Mendelian genetics that there are uh, certain, uh, there are certain parts of our human body that basically carries a way for our traits to be passed down from our parent to us and from us to our children. Okay. We know this as DNA today. Okay. We know this as DNA. DNA was only discovered in 1953. Okay. Before that, there was a lot of debate and discussion about how traits are being passed or characteristics are being passed from parent to child. Okay. So Lysenko actually uh, felt that heritable characteristics were shaped directly by adaptation to the environment. Okay. So his concept was applied to agriculture during the Stalin era with disastrous consequences. So he tried, basically, he felt that um, that, that vernalization, right, was something that can actually be manipulated. Um, so this particular phenomenon is where by if let's say you expose seeds of crop plants to cold, then you can actually stim stimulate the germination. But Lysenko claimed that the use would be greatly increased. If let's say the seeds of winter crop varieties that died in harsh frost were exposed to lower temperatures before sowing, and then sown in spring the same way as spring varieties. So he believes that heritable changes arise in plants as a result of fertilization. While genetics is already like false. However, because this guy was powerful, he decided to implement it uh, immediately in 1931. Okay. And he did it very large. He did it in very large scale. And he did it without prior need, any prior testing. Okay. So while Genesis normally tries to do it in new varieties within four to five years, okay, Lysenko claimed he could do this in two to three years and actually started reporting imaginary achievements. Okay. Um, now, this was embraced by authorities because um, they had already mismanaged agriculture and that led to mass death from hunger in Russia back in those days. So they actually felt that Lysenko was promising good things. He seemed very confident and they felt that this was the right guy to lead the uh, sort of agricultural revolution. Um, but during this period of time, right, genetics in the Soviet Union actually stagnated because uh, nobody was allowed to challenge Lysenko's ideas. Okay, so during the height of this particular point in time, scientists were not allowed to do research that would challenge his views. They were not allowed to publish papers that challenged Lysenko, and they were not allowed to teach or even discuss views that contradicted him. Okay, so more than three thousand biologists were fired, arrested, or executed. So Vavilov, uh, Nikolai Vavilov, was actually disgracefully dismissed from the presidency of the Agricultural Academy in 1938 and died in prison in 1940, okay? All right, so that was basically the issue with Lysenko. Um, during this period also, because it actually failed uh, very spectacularly, it also led to, uh, you know, large droughts and also crop failures, okay? So yeah, um, so that was quite bad. Um, there's this other case called the Tuskegee syphilis study, okay, where um, this was also sometime in yeah 1932, where physicians at the Tuskegee Institute, which is in Tuskegee, Alabama, conducted research on African American men who were suffering from syphilis. Okay, so um, syphilis is is either an STI, which is a sexually transmitted infection, 
or it could be um, cold sores in the mouth. Okay, so it depends. So um, this particular case, right, was basically done on African American men. The purpose of it was to understand the natural history of syphilis, how does it progress, and what's the natural history of the disease, and not to develop treatments. Okay, so. This study was very weird because it was not divided into experimental and control subgroups. They were just simply observed without giving any help or treatment. So some of the physicians actually who initially proposed the idea said it would only last a year. But the study lasted nearly 40 years, long after an effective treatment for syphilis, which is penicillin, became available in the mid-1940s. Now, during this process, right, there was no patient consent that was obtained. Okay, because they were doing these spinal taps, okay, and they were disguised as free treatment. But it was not actually treatment, it was just data collection. Subjects who participated in the study were not told that they were receiving no genuine treatment. They were not told about the nature of the disease, nor were they even told they were participating in the experiment. They were just simply offered free medical care, as well as hot lunches, examinations, and free burials. Okay. So this is part of the reason. OK, why? And obviously, when they found out about it, you know, they shut it down because um, they realized that, you know, um, these people are not being treated. Um, they were just left to die eventually. Um, and um, it actually led to a lot of mistrust among the African-American community living in these areas about what scientists actually had to offer. OK, so so that was part of the issue here. OK, so if let's say you're looking for any research ethics um, case studies, you know, to teach or for any other reason, you can actually find them quite easily um, in various different places. Yeah. Any questions regarding my presentation so far? Okay, everybody's just looking forward to the weekend. Okay, um, all right, no problem, no problem, no problem. Okay, um, so before we before we end, um, I'm just gonna bring you guys through some of the various different wait now um, because my PDF. Uh, my PDF viewer hasn't been able to load, so I'm just going to load it on Chrome and do it from there. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Can I? Okay, great. So give Google Chrome a chance to respond. Okay, now great. Okay, so this was a research policy for research ethics that was that was something that we worked on before I left. Okay, um, and uh, something that we managed to get passed in the Senate on the eighth of October, twenty twenty one. Okay, so this particular research ethics policy basically outlined. What are the various different roles, responsibilities, codes of conduct uh, that is required for researchers as they do their research? Uh, this is um, the policy that is, um, you guys can find it in your SharePoint. Okay. Um, if you're not sure where it is, you guys can ask Florence or Jiahui. Okay. 
and it basically outlines the various different definitions and also principles that I just talked about. Okay. Um, and also talks about all the deals, all of these principles with relation to research with non-human animals at the university college. Okay. So particularly with animal care, but I don't think anybody here is working with animals, right? Okay. Um, so this particular research ethic policy is the responsibility of RIEC, which is the Research Innovation Enterprise Committee. Okay. And this particular uh, body is made up of people from PGRC and also members from the various different schools. Um, this particular RIC has the responsibility to approve all research on humans, animals conducted under the authority of the institution. RIC generally only meets like three times a year, but anytime that you submit a research ethics uh, form, it will actually be circulated by email and if let's say there are no objections, you generally get passed. Okay? Um, this responsibility may be subdelegated to school or institute, which may in turn devolve the responsibility for approval for academic staff, for undergraduate and postgraduate level students, project as appropriate. So meaning to say that if you let's say you're doing research at the FYP level, normally it will be the school's uh, the school's responsibility, or even the academic staff's responsibility to approve uh, research ethics. Okay. Um, in cases of uncertainty, right? PGRC will act as the uh, PGRC will act as the sort of like the referee la, and they will forward anything to RIC if let's say there's any miss if let's say there's any uh, confusion or any kind of uh, gray area. Okay. Um, code of conduct, um, all of these I just said earlier, basically. Um, how you deal with your participants or how you conduct your research, uh, whether or not you scatter informed consent. Okay, um, and all of these various things, how you manipulate them, all of these things are outlined in this particular policy. Okay, the policy also covers re uh, aspects related to academic publishing. Okay, so um, and how you actually, you know, okay, so, so that's all the things that we talked about earlier. Like, this is all of the concepts, the principles, and all of the various different. Uh, aspects you need to be aware of. Now, what is the process? Okay. Ethical clearance, right, for all coursework students will be handled by your respective schools. Okay. Um, if you haven't already started it, then perhaps it would be a good idea for you to consider um, either having this as part of the declaration, you know, when you wrote, when you do the declaration for your FYP, right, in the early part of the uh, in the early part of your thesis, you should have an aspect there where it talks about ethical um, the way it's being, the way research is being done. Okay, um, postgraduate by research students on the other hand are required to complete the research ethics application form and submit the form for approval. Okay, there are altogether three categories for self assessment in the research ethics application. Where if let's say there is no ethical risk, which is considered green. Okay, then the supervisor can review the application. If it's orange, when it's minimal application risk, minimal ethics risk, then it can be uh, referred to the department or the school. If it's, let's say it's red, that means there is an ethical risk, right? It will need to be sent to RAC for the preparation. Um, what, we, what do we consider green, orange, and red? Okay, so generally speaking, green is where, um, wait, I think there is an explanation for this. Um, huh? Yeah, so generally speaking, green is when, like, let's say, for example, you're working in AI or working in coding or any sort of thing which does not affect any kind of humans. OK, or let's say you're collecting data based on. Um, you know, physical. Uh, or, or you're dealing, just dealing with materials, OK, there's no ethical risk. Uh, orange can actually relate to. Um, interviews, surveys, that kind of uh, where there's very minimal ethical risk, which typically has to deal with people's emotions or people's psychological well-being. 
Okay, so very minimal application ethical risk. Red normally involves any kind of invasive or any kind of animal sacrificing that's required. Um, typically, this is normally the case of biological schools, which we actually don't have. Okay, so uh, that is generally the, the green orange red that we deal with. Um, there is also a part of disciplinary action. So if let's say um, there is any evidence of research misconduct, a whistleblower can actually uh, submit the research misconduct report form to BGRC and they will conduct a preliminary assessment and which will then form a disciplinary committee if let's say the report is believed to be valid. Okay, the disciplinary committee shall comprise of either the VC or the DVC academic, two heads of school and one subject expert. And they will basically be de dealing with the cases of claim of research misconduct. Okay, uh, PGRC will act as secretary. And if let's say they are found to be guilty, um, it could lead to suspension or pay or without pay or termination. All right, so that's basically disciplinary action. Any questions so far? What I just said just now was actually quite heavy, though. but any questions? Oh, good, huh? Um, you guys can refer to this policy. It's, it's actually quite long. Um, you guys can refer to it uh, later uh, when you guys are, when you guys have the time. Um, so this is the research ethics application form, okay? Um, so this ethics application, oh, hang on a second, hang on a second. It's good, we'll always resign ourselves about this, okay, great. Um, research at this application form, right, this is one that was uh, developed already. Um, so basically, there's a little bit of, uh, you guys can get the updated copy from, I think this might be just a draft copy, you guys can get the updated one from either Florence or Jeffrey. Um, so the, the first part is all the descriptive parts. Um, you need to briefly outline your research topic and give a short description of the proposed research methods. Um, go through the checklist, okay? Um, does your resolve, uh, research involve any external organization, partner, so on and so forth? Um, and then is there any deception? Are they constituting a vulnerable group? Will it be commercially, personally, politically, or legally sensitive? Is it likely to have any significant environmental impacts? Are there likely to be any risk for the participants in your research? Are there likely to be any risk for you in conducting your research? If there's any yes to any of the event of the identified steps above, how will you address the issues and mitigate any risks? Okay, so um, in the same way as any kind of research grant application, right? These are normally some of the leaky faucets. Lah. It's not really very important. I would no, hang on a second. It is important, but it's normally very not well covered. Okay, people normally care about the research idea rather than all of these little uh, details that you know people may not necessarily people may necessarily overlook. Lah. Okay, so um, then it comes to the ethical category. Like for example, rate like I said earlier, vulnerable participants, human, animal, biohazard, environmental, human tissue sensitive data risk to participants or researchers, orange, where you require informed consent or you're dealing with commercially sensitive information, green, where there are no participants involved, you only deal with secondary data or you don't deal with sensitive data. Okay, then you sign and then you get approval. So um, for green, right, um, this is normally at supervisor level. Orange is normally at school level. Red is normally for research committee. OK, then once it is once it is done, then you decide whether you should approve or not approve. And then after that, you know, um, this has to be done by two reviewers. And final approval by HOD or HOS or chair of RREs. OK, so this is the research ethics application form. Uh, please make sure this is done before you go out and start collecting data. <laughs> All right, um, so yeah. That's that. So this is an example of a research participant consent form. Okay. 
So um, this consent form basically tells you the name of the participant, organization, the researcher's name, title, program study, and the supervisor's name. Then you describe what are you actually doing, and the participant has to confirm that they have been briefed, um, that any requirement for anonymity or confidentiality has been discussed, and that they agree to being recorded film or photographs. Okay, uh, you can delete this as appropriate. All right. Um, then the participant has to sign and date, and this researcher has to also sign and date. Okay. Um, so this is template number one. This is a consent form. Template number two is the participant information. Okay. So it's more or less the same. Okay. And gives the same kind of data. And it's, it's, this is something for, you know, the participant to basically bring home also. Lah. This is the information sheet. All right. Okay. Lastly, this is something that you probably hopefully never want to see. Okay. Um, so research misconduct report. So let's say you feel that your colleague or you know anybody in the organization that you feel is conduct is is conducting any form of research misconduct. Okay, you can fill up this form. You can find it in SharePoint. Your name here as whistleblower. Okay. The parties involved here mean to say that the people that you feel are conducting or are, are conducting research misconduct. You need to report your evidence and please provide supporting documents as evidence. Okay. And then after that, this will be submitted to PGRC. When do they receive it? Who received it? They will do a preliminary assessment. Okay. And then if let's say they feel that they should proceed, then they will go and convene the disciplinary committee and then the disciplinary committee will make their uh, investigation and then after that their judgment. Any questions? So these, these documents are all available on your SharePoint. Uh, I just sent them to you for you to have a review. Um, you can actually get all of this information and then after that deal with it. Um, so normally what we would say is if you have a PhD student, perhaps get all of these research ethics clearances uh, before data collection. OK, um, if you haven't done so already, please get it done now. Um, and uh, please make sure that this is done uh, in compliance lah, with research ethics. OK. Any questions? Okay, so um, Ramesh. Should whistleblower remain anonymous? Um, for the purpose of this research misconduct form, we will actually require you to identify yourself. But this will be kept confidential at PGRC level because we will need to actually verify and validate. So there may be a requirement to actually do some digging on the PGRC side. Okay, uh, that's why uh, we need you to identify yourself. You know, otherwise, you know, if if everybody submits research misconduct forms, you know, we don't know where to start. Um, so there has to be some way for us to track back. Okay, but. PGRC itself will sort of remain as the kind of uh, uh, referee la in this case. Okay. What do you think of supervising PhD students? Yet supervisors are required to help them excessively. Okay. Um, this is not really regarding research ethics. This is more regarding. Uh, managing the researcher, managing the supervisor supervisee kind of relationship, which is under postgraduate supervision practices. Um, it depends. Okay. Uh, so in some cases, right, Aja, um, like if I have an FRGS project, like when I have an FRGS project and I am actually looking to do research on a conceptual framework that I developed myself. And that has already been approved by 
uh, by 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 the project by the by by the government, you know, by everyone involved, and they are supposed to just run the project for me. Then, yeah, you know, we are the ones providing variables. We are the ones providing instruments. They're just there to actually run it. If let's say the supervisee is just trying to come up with their own project, but expect you to do the work, then you have to be able to, uh, first of all, make sure that, you know, they are fully aware that you are not there to do their work for them. Okay. Um, so this is part of your role as a supervisor that you are able to, first of all, make it very clear what is the expectation on them and make it very clear uh, that you, what is your role in this particular relationship? Okay. Um, so in that sense, right, it's not really an ethical issue. It's more about making sure that they are aware of the expectations on them. If let's say they can't deliver, then they can't pass. It's just that simple. Okay. Um, so you need to just make that very simple. Uh, okay. Um, I hope that was a good answer. <laughs> okay, I, I will I will move on to Sanjay's one. Yeah. Ajay, if you got any additional thing you can do, that. you can just text me again. Sanjay, what do you think of doing qualitative research in a Malaysian context? For example, ethnography, what are the ethical areas that are often overlooked? Um it still applies to informed consent. Um, the thing about ethnography is that you are not going to get very far if you don't respect local customs. If you're not accepted by the, uh, if you're not accepted by the community and people don't trust you, generally you're not going to get your data anyway. So um, it's it's a bit, you know, it, you. Yeah, the ethical thing would mainly have to do with how you actually go about collecting your data. Okay. Um, if let's say you are paying people to give you data, okay, uh, then it becomes a bit of a. It it's it's a it can be a bit of a gray area. Okay. Um, but if let's say you ensure that ultimately you stick with the principle of doing good. And not doing harm generally people won't have an issue okay another issue that can actually happen is about um autonomy okay so if let's say you approach people they don't agree uh one issue that can often be overlooked is that people tend to take matters into their own hands they tend to pr produce mainly regarding participant observation okay but they may actually uh, portrayed as if it was not their own in uh, uh, it was not like their own observation it was an observation of another person so they are misrepresenting or they are misappropriating certain things okay so it's actually their own observations but they are creating imaginary characters to basically narrate the story for them okay because nobody's actually going to go in and check okay so that is a very gray area or that is a very uh, particular area that is very prone for misconduct. Lah. Okay, so so those are the things that can actually happen. That's also part of the reason why a lot of people don't believe in qualitative studies. Okay, they feel that they are rife with bias. Um, the people only report what they want to report. Okay, and and those are the things that uh, tends to happen when it comes to ethnographic kind of research. Yeah, um, qualitative research is a bit challenging, uh, ethically speaking. There are no real uh, areas whereby um, you can say that you are breaching ethical research ethics, but then at the same time, there's a lot of um, there are a lot of risk factors when it comes to professional conduct. Okay, because there's no real oversight. Okay, you go into the you go into a community and then. You try to do different things and you talk to different people and ultimately you need to be uh, accountable to yourself as far as how honest you're going to be. Okay. Did I answer your question, Sanjay? Yeah, All right, so um, just to obviously we are due. I, I mean, I'm done with my content. Okay, 
uh, for the remainder of the uh, for the remainder of the training, okay, it will just be more of a self reflection exercise. Um, all of you have a copy of the research consent form. Perhaps all of you can just try uh, filling it up based on your current research projects or your students' research projects, and kind of doing a self reflection of your own um, uh, perspective of research ethics and also the degree of kind of like the research ethics uh, that your students are currently doing and use this as a way for you to kind of uh, look into how you are actually, um, how you're actually able to uh, describe all of the ethical risks that are, that are in your own research areas. Okay, if you would like, you can actually send them to me and I can actually send you my comments as well. Um, you can get my email at, yeah, just type it out, lah, just in case. Um, the, the email that I sent earlier, but if you can't, if you missed that, then uh, my email is here. Okay. Otherwise, I will just miss you guys for today. And then, um, yeah, we can catch up online. Some of you guys have my number. Um, otherwise, it's probably easier for you to catch me on my email <laughs> because I don't have actually have an actual phone. Okay, these days I'm, I I was using my tablet as a phone because uh, during Chinese New Year my tab my my phone died on me. I've stuck my SIM card into my tablet and I've been using it ever since. Um, so for like the last six months, and I am not very. I only check my WhatsApp and my uh and my other instant messaging periodically. I don't always check it. So yeah, get me catch me my email. Okay. Otherwise, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, hope to see you again soon. Take care. Is it done? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm in the middle of something just now. I know. <laughs> sorry. So, right. so thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you for today. No problem. I will see you. All right. See ya. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.